Hi, and welcome back. So in this video, I'm going to cover my longevity experiment biometric data for January, February, March and April of 2025. That does mark the six year point, which is the 72 month point of my longevity experiment. And we can compare that data to when I started recording it way back in April of 2019. Some things have changed. I used to use this, the Omeron full body sensor for gathering all my biometric data. Quite a chunky piece of kit, but it did uh, it did the job. I've now upgraded to the Bodypedia Smart Body Analyzer. Uh, I only just received this. Um, I've only just learned how to switch it on. I've downloaded the app and I've gathered the first set of data. Um, it gathers a lot more data than this one does. I haven't worked out exactly what I want to record from this, although it is always on my phone. Uh, I will put it onto a spreadsheet. As the days and the weeks and the months go by and I learn more about this, I probably will upgrade or update the data that's on the spreadsheet that I show you on the video. So enough waffling off me. Let's jump in. Have a look at my subjective stats. Let's take a look at the supplements I was taking for the four months leading up to this update. Nicotinamide mononucleotide, 1.5 grams per day, one gram a day of trans resveratrol. And that's only on the days that I don't train in the gym. So Tuesday, Thursday and Saturdays. I've then got metformin, and for metformin, we've got 1,000 milligrams a day, or one gram a day, split into two 500 milligram doses. More about the dosing later. Then we've got trimethylglycine, TMG, 1.5 grams a day of that. Vitamin D3, 5,000 international units per day, 10,000 on a Monday and a Wednesday. Vitamin K2, 120 micrograms of vitamin K2. That's the MK7 version. Magnesium, 250 milligrams of the L3 and 8 version. High molecular weight, hyaluronic acid, 400 milligrams a day of that. Then we've got fisetin, 2.4 grams a day of that. And that, those days are the first, second and third of each month. Then we've got quercetin and again, 2.4 grams of quercetin on the first, second and third of each month. And if you want to know why I use a periodic dosing protocol and not a maintenance daily one, there's a link in the description below to my periodic dosing video. Next, we've got CERT6 activator, 400 milligrams a day of that. Then we've got DIM, 600 milligrams a day of DIM. Again, more on the dosing protocol in just a second. Then we've got Glynac, glycine and NAC, N-acetylcysteine. And for that, I'm taking 800 milligrams a day. Then we've got creatine. I do three months on and one month off, and that's five grams per day. Omega-3. 800 milligrams of EPA and 600 milligrams of DHA. And then the last thing on the list is berberine. And I'm now taking 500 milligrams a day of that. Now I take the vast majority of my supplements between 6 and 6.15 in the morning. My DIM is now split into two doses. That's 300 milligrams first thing in the morning between 6 and 6.15. And the second one is between 8 and 9 just before I go to bed. Metformin is one gram. Uh, berberine is now half a gram, and both of these I take uh, in the afternoon just before I have my lunch, which is also my breakfast because I'm on now one meal a day. I do still take resveratrol on the days that I don't lift weights in the gym. Uh, it's mixed into whatever high fat yogurt I can get hold of here in the Philippines. And again, as I said, I only take that on the Tuesday, Thursday and the Saturday and occasionally I'll take it on the Sunday depending on how I feel. So that's it for my supplement stack. So let's move on to my diet and fasting. First of all, my fasting. I'm now on OMAD, one meal a day, and that's every day of the week. I've got a two hour eating window. That's somewhere between one and four in the afternoon. So for diet, up until lunchtime, I really only drink water, black coffee, and the occasional cup of green tea. For my main meal, um, which is the big meal where I get all of my calories, that's normally eaten, as I say, by about 4 p.m., uh, meat, eggs and vegetables. The meat is now more often than not uh, chicken, uh, although it is sometimes beef, sometimes cruciferous vegetables if I can get hold of them, but they are, they are hard to get hold of here regularly in the Philippines. Um, bacon and egg or sausage and egg is also a lunchtime option. And um, the bacon here is fresh as is uh, the, the sausages. They're not, pro or they're not ultra processed foods, so to speak. Uh, for snacks, if I do snack, and that is very rarely, I might sometimes have a 
um, a shake, and that's from um, a fruit shake, a dark, dark fruit shake like strawberries, blueberries, blackberries. Again, they're difficult to get hold of. So if they are in the freezer in the supermarket, I will grab a bag of that. If I can't do that, then I will take uh, a small bottle of nuts, but that is very, very infrequently. Alcohol, no wine or vodka over the last four months. I've had one beer. Um, Uncle Julius is over for the fiesta season from America. So I had a beer with him. Saturday nights used to be the wife and I sitting outside um, watching YouTube, chatting. Uh, and we would have maybe two or three glasses of wine, two or three glasses of beer. And I then moved on to vodka and Diet Coke for the last four months. As I say, no wine, no beer, no vodka, apart from the one beer with Uncle Julius. Uh, I'm now trying to stick to just having two or three diet sodas when we sit outside and chat. So that's it for my diet and fasting. Let's move on to my overall feeling and specifically my energy. I'll put it still somewhere between high and steady and ever so slightly improving consistently. One thing I've noticed is the days after my blood test are quite interesting when it comes to my energy level. So we stay in a hotel for two to three days uh, at the beginning when I have my blood test. The food in the hotel is always very, very good, but some of it might be cooked in seed oils. And then after that, when we don't eat in the hotel, obviously we're eating out in malls and restaurants. So I know definitely ultra processed foods and definitely cooked in seed oils. Now the first day after my blood test is okay, but the second and third day, I definitely feel different. There's something um, there's something wrong. I'm nowhere near as energetic. Um, my wife might even say I'm probably more grouchy than usual. My sleep is generally okay. Uh, and it is hard to pinpoint one thing in particular that I feel is off, but I know I do. I definitely do feel strange after I've been eating processed foods for two or three days. When I then get back home and I start eating my whole food diet, it normally takes two or three days to get back um, to feeling normal again. So overall feeling energy over the four months is still high, but it does take a hit when I'm eating processed foods when we're away for two or three days. So that's it for overall feeling and energy levels. So sticking with overall feeling, let's first of all look at napping. Uh, no, na no napping or sleeping in the afternoons at all. If you are subscribed, you'll know that I do occasionally post my sleep scores in the community tab. Next, we've got motivation. I've changed this to motivation and attitude because my motivation, as most people's will, does wax and wane. But it's my attitude that will get me up in the morning and to the gym and to walk the dog for the full 30 minutes, even when it's pouring with rain uh, and she's trying to pull because she wants to head home too. Especially now, because the kids are off school, it would be much easier and nicer for me to stay in bed for another hour, um, walk the dog, and then go to the gym a little bit later. But I'm still going to bed at the same time. I'm still getting seven plus hours of sleep a night. So it seems pointless to just lay around in bed for that one hour just because I can. So I'm still getting up at six. But instead of then getting the kids ready for school and walking the dog, I'm going straight to the gym. I'm training in the gym for 40, 45 minutes. Then I'm coming back and walking the dog. And then it's into the normal routine of making coffee, uh, reading emails, etc. So that's it for my motivation. Gym performance. Um, so still weight training on a Monday, Wednesday and Friday. And again, between 40 and 50 minutes a day. Ruck running on a Tuesday. And that's normally about 40 minutes a day. And then Thursday is a rest day because we head into the city to go shopping. And Saturday is the one hour bike ride. So if you are subscribed, you'll see that I do post my stats for heart rates, etc., etc. occasionally in the community tab. I'm recording and uploading this on a Saturday. So I went for a bike ride this morning and I've already uploaded those specific statistics. So injuries, thankfully in 2025, no injuries as of yet. Uh, fingers crossed there won't be any. And sickness again in 2025, no sickness whatsoever, which again is good. So that's it for my subjective stats for the first quarter of 2025. Let's move on to my subjective stats. And some of these are going to be slightly weird because I have changed, as I said earlier, the biometric scale. So my weight, you can see there, um, going back to April, 92 kilos, which is 202 pounds to start with. In December of last year, it was 83.84 kilos, 184.8 pounds. It's now down to 81.7 kilos, which is about 180.1 pounds. So that's down 2.14 kilograms, which is 4.7 pounds since the last check. And down overall, 10.3 kilograms, down 22.7 pounds since the start. 
Now, my BMI, which you may know I'm not too enthralled with as a formula for health and uh, fitness, it was 27.3. It's now down to 26.68. So down 0 0.62 since the last check and down 3.32 since the start. My percentage body fat, you can see in April, 23%. Um, it went from 22 to 26 here because I did change the scales again. You can see the change in color from gray to clear. Uh, in December, it was 20%. That's my percentage body fat. And now it's 19.38. So again, this may be something to do with changing the scales. I'm not too sure. We'll see as we go ahead. So overall, that's down 0 0.62 since the last check and down 3.62% 3, 3 since the start. Moving on to my muscle mass. Now, my muscle mass percentage is what was scored before. My skeletal muscle from now on is going to be measured in kilograms of my overall body weight. So the first measurement in May, um, my skeletal mass is 35.93 kilograms. So of my whatever my body weight was, I think my body weight was 81.7 uh, kilograms. My muscle mass, 35.93 of that is actually muscle. So that's it for my muscle mass. Moving on to my basal metabolic rate. It was 1717 with the new scales. It's now 1765, so up 48 since the last check. Not really a relevant metric unless you are counting your calories and you then know that for me, 1765 is the amount of calories I'll burn anyway, regardless of doing it. It's what, it's what you burn when you rest. So you add on to that. Uh, the amount of calories that you're going to eat. So if you're going to eat, say, 2,000 calories per day, that leaves you the remainder that you need to burn off with exercise. Next thing is my visceral fat. This is something that I really did want to get down. You can see there it's hovering between 12 and 13. Um, this new scales that I've got or the new scales that I bought are supposed to be far more accurate. So this has changed quite a lot. It's gone from 12 all the way down to 7. Um, Previously, when I've researched this, they've said that a visceral fat is 12 or under should be healthy. This um, scale has got me at seven and it says anything less than nine is healthy. So I'm very happy that it's seven uh, and not nine. Also, with the app that you get with, um, with this uh, particular scale, you look on the app on the phone. It says my risk of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is normal. So... I'm hoping that as I continue to exercise and continue to lose weight, my visceral fat level will go down and hopefully my non-alcoholic fatty liver disease risk will also go down as well. Uh, the next one then we've got is waist. You can see there that my waist was 39 in April of uh, 2019. Now this scale I've got is pretty good. I don't need to use the measuring tape anymore for some reason. Uh, I don't know how it does it, but it can measure all sorts of things like your neck circumference, your arms, your legs, uh, how much water you've got in your body, how many minerals you've got in your body. It also measures your waist size too. So my waist was 34. Um, this time it's saying 35.6. I'm guessing this is accurate and maybe my measuring wasn't so accurate because I don't think I put an extra inch and a half on. Um, that said, I'm going to go with this. It says it's at 1.6 since the last check but it's still down 3.4 inches since the start. So I'm, I'm happy that I'm still three and a half inches slimmer around the waist than I was before. What this scale does do that I didn't want to work out myself was my hip to weight ratio, which is another good metric of longevity. It's saying that my hip to waist ratio is 0 0.9. And they say the healthy ratio is anything less than 0 0.9. So I'm right on the border. Um, again, as I continue to lose weight. I'm hoping that my hip to waist ratio is going to drop. Also, moving on to my sleep, you can see here that before the apps that I had for my Mi Band would record the monthly stats for overall light, deep and REM sleep. Unfortunately, the Ultra Human Ring and the upgrade, so-called upgrade of Mi Band 8 does not allow you to gather that information on their app anymore. So all I'm gathering at the moment is my overall sleep. You can see here for the last four months, January, my average sleep was seven hours and 55. In February, it was seven hours and 47. In March, it was seven hours and 34 minutes per night. And in April, the average was seven hours 
and 50 minutes per night. Now, if you are subscribed to the channel, you'll know that I do post my sleep scores pretty much every day. Uh, and that does cover the overall, the light, the deep and the REM sleep. Uh, and it gives me a score as well. So that's it for my sleep scores. My rest in heart rate, you can see there started back in May of 2020. I'll scroll down slowly. If you want to pause, you can look at how they work in their way out or how they work their scores out. Uh, for the last four months in January, my average was 53. That's my rest in heart rate. In February, the average was 53 again. In March, the average uh, rest in heart rate was 54. And in April, it was 51. So the average of those four months is a resting heart rate of 52.75. And if you look up here to someone who's aged um, 61 like I am, you can see that anywhere between 56 and 65, which is where I am, technically has been athlete as an athlete, which is nice, but I don't think I am actually, uh, should be in the athlete category. Uh, the next one then is my grip strength. You can see that um, in December, my left hand was 108.2 pounds and my right hand was 119.9 pounds. This time, slightly down, 107.8 pounds grip for my left hand and 117.8 for my right hand. That says when you look at those scores for someone who's aged between 60 and 64, uh, I'm still in the strong category. So I'm more than happy with that. Then we've got my steps. Uh, you can see my target is 5,000 steps. That's based on the majority of all the scientific studies that I've uh, reviewed, albeit epidemiological. Uh, I'll scroll down slowly so you can look if you want to check what they were for the months leading up to now. So for the last four months, you can see that my daily steps in January were 6,685. In February, they were 6,641. In March, right up there, 7,299. Not sure what happened in March. Uh, and in April, it was 5,032. So the average for the last four months, 6,414, which again is well over my 5,000 step average. So that's it for my objective stats. So I think all in all, the numbers are OK, either getting slightly better or staying the same. And nothing, thankfully, is consistently moving in the wrong direction. Now, I think the reason I gather all this data is because trends are key. Um, and according to the vast majority of the research I've done, including one very good study at Harvard, most adults, that's you and me, gain between one or two pounds of weight per year. And I'm guessing they're not packing on lean muscle. And as well as that, people tend to gain one or two inches per year to their waist circumference. Now, my waist at the start of this was 39 inches. It's now only 34. If I've been adding that one or two inches, I would have a 51 inch waist now instead of 35. My weight at the start was 202 pounds and I'm now 180. And again, if I'd followed the norms of me packing on that weight, I could now be 214 pounds and not the 180 that I am. Add to that, my body fat percentage is staying fairly steady, if not dropping ever so slightly. And we'll find out as the months carry on what my skeletal muscle weight is also uh, is also doing. Hopefully that is also going to carry on going up or at least stay in the same. Uh, let me know what you think of these six-year results.